Sahadamika friends, dependent origination is the heart of our Dhamma study, and Anapanasati is the heart of our Dhamma practice. For this reason, we will speak about anapanasati, or mindfulness with breathing, today. Anapanasati will help us to be successful in practicing according to the law of Paticca Samuppada. On mindfulness with breathing is, the, is practice on the level of samadhi and vipassana. Nonetheless, sila or morality is, is hidden or contained within it. Therefore, it's a complete practice. The intention to practice, to set one's mind on practicing, this is sila, morality. Then to actually practice is samadhi. And then seeing clearly into the nature of things, this is vipassana or insight. In this way, there, sila, samadhi, and panya are working together, are contained together in mindfulness with breathing. When we consider the the meaning or how to translate the word anapanasati, we can say in, it basically means to attend to one, one object that we ought to pay attention to with every inhalation and exhalation. Literally, this means we could pay attention to anything, we could um, reflect on anything while breathing in and out. For example, if one was homesick, one could think of one's home while breathing in and out, and you could call that anapanasati if you, if you wished. So one can note or pay attention to some material object or some certain place or a friend or in the end to, to Dhamma. But however, whichever we choose, we must attend to or take note of one particular object while, while breathing in and out. There must be some matter or object of our attention. And so anapanasati can be used in even very worldly ways or even for children to, to play with. It's in fact been used in rather demonic ways. This, because the meaning of mindfulness with breathing is, is very broad, so it can be used in all sorts of ways. Or in brief, we could say anapanasati is a way of using the breath in order to get the most benefit from it. Now we'll look at the history of this particular aspect of culture. So if we, for example, if we think back to the, the human beings of many thousands of years ago, people in the forests and caves who were lived an extremely primitive life, the ones who went around almost naked. They were able to use the breathing <coughs> in certain ways in order to benefit their lives, to bring about some of the things that they, they sought. This is because it's a completely natural matter. The breathing is a tool of nature to bring about health and well-being. For example, and so certain things happen very naturally, such as when we're tired, we'll breathe rather quickly, sometimes we'll even pant in order to get enough oxygen. This is a, 
a technique which the body has to to remove the tiredness by using the breathing. Or if we have a wound or cut and the blood is flowing quite a bit, one can breathe in a very subtle, refined, peaceful way and the blood will flow much more slowly and one loses much less blood. This is a natural kind of technique or a secret of the breathing which can be used if we understand it. And so the, the, our primitive ancestors, ancestors, ancestors learned to use the breathing for their own benefit. And then the rishis and munis, the hermits and sages in the forests, they learned how to use anapanasati. On a quite a high level, they became very skilled and good at it. And then later the, the doctors and physicians learned to use anapanasati for the sake of health. And then the yaksas, the demons and maras, demons and devils or whatever who were engaged in fighting and killing. They even learned to use the breathing to help them in their demonic work. And this led to their developing a system of practice using the breathing, systematic approach to it, to make, to really work with the breathing. And this was called pranayama, which is to, to breath control. And so various forms of pranayama were used by all the different groups and sects in India. And they were adjusted and improved according, accordingly until the Buddha's time. And the Buddha took this and, and perfected it. And so now we have the Buddhist approach to anapanasati, which Buddhists have a, their our own special form of it, as was taught by the Lord Buddha. In this system of anapanasati, it's been improved and adjusted until we can get the fullest this pranayama has been improved until we can get the fullest benefit from controlling or working with the breath, from mastering the breath. And so this, this anapanasati became so widespread in India, it became almost a custom or a tradition so that young people, young men, were quite familiar with it. As we can see from the stories that Prince Siddhartha knew about this even at a very young age, even at the age of seven, <coughs> he, he tried this out. And this seems to imply that anapanasati was very widespread and customary in India at that time. We might be able to say that every school, group, and sect of, of religious seekers in India at that time used some form of pranayama as the basis of their practice in order to master the breathing and control their minds. So we, can, we might be able to say that every one of them used some form of pranayama or breath control. The Buddha himself said that while he lived or dwelled practicing anapanasati, he realized the anuttara samasam potiyan or the unsurpassed right self-awakening or perfect self-enlightenment. 
And so the Buddha advised that we use anapanasati to solve even low and crude problems, such as he advised us to use it in terms of vinaya, to eliminate certain low, lowly things that obstruct vinaya practice. For example, the passage where he recommended it to the monks who had been there's the time when the monks, a bunch of monks, were committing suicide. And so he recommended anapanasati as gayakata sati, mindfulness of the body practice, so that the monks wouldn't get out of balance and, and kill themselves. Why do we have the problem of trying to choose which kind of which system of meditation to use. There have been all kinds of types of meditation set up since the Buddha's time. So now people are confused about which one to practice. This is rather unfortunate when anapanasati can solve all the problems and so in itself is sufficient, is, is good enough. We can say that anapanasati is a, the system which is cool and convenient. In anapanasati, we don't have to deal with frightening, fearsome, or confusing objects. There's nothing to make the mind busy or anxious, such as with corpse meditations and things like that. And anap so the mind can be it's a very cool practice. We can approach it, we can be very cool while going about it. And it's also convenient because you don't have to have anything special to do it or bring around any paraphernalia or apparatus because wherever you go, the breath is right there. So anapanasati is the system of practice which is cool and convenient. Next, we'll examine the word prana. Originally, the word prana means breath, but then people notice that when there is breathing, there is life, and when there is life, there is the breath. And so the meaning of prana expanded to, to mean all of life. And so sometimes prana means the breath, and sometimes it means life. In the, for the ordinary people on the streets, prana seems to have meant life more than, than breath. An example from our tradition is the first um, training, the first sikabata of banati bata veramani, about not causing other beings to be separated from prana or pana means not to cause other beings to lose their, their prana, their life. In, in Thai, they have the advantage of the word lom prana, or you could call it wind of life or life breath. And so when, one, when one's lom prana is finished, then one, one dies. So this even can mean both breath or, or life. And so anapanasati then is a way of arranging, working with, practicing with the breathing in order to get the most benefit from the breathing and from life. This is what the system of anapanasati is about. Now we'll speak about the practice of mindful witness with breathing directly. This system of practice is broken up into four areas or four stages. The first is to is breathing using the breathing regarding the body. 
The second is to make use of the breathing regarding the vetana, the feelings. Third is to make use of the breathing regarding the jitta, or the heart, the mind. And the fourth is using the breathing regarding dhamma. The first area is called the, the, the body, um, the body area or the body stage or which, and here body is a translation of the word gaya, gaya. The Buddha said that the breath is one particular body or kaya among all bodies. And so we can use the word body to refer to this flesh and blood body of ours, but we can also use the word kaya or body in terms of the breath. We can call the breath a body also. So when we speak of the, the body group, the body area of stage of practice, we are speaking about using the breathing. The breathing itself is one body, is a, a certain very special body. The first lesson in this stage of practice is about the long breathing. In this we, we study the long breathing until we know it very well, until we kn know it in all angles and all aspects. So we study the long breathing until seeing very clearly what kind of nature it has or what its characteristics are, what it's like, and seeing the kind of results that come from the long breathing, particularly what influence or power it has over the rest of the body. So what kind of results come from very, very long breathing? And what, are the, what is the result of not so long breathing? then what is the result of medium long breathing? Study these different kinds of long breathing until it's very clear and very certain how the, what kind of results the long breathing, how the long breathing affects the body or affects life. The second lesson is to study the short breathing. We study it in the same way as the long breathing. That is to see what its nature is, to see what kind of characteristics it has, to see what, what influence, how it influences things, to see what kind of results come from it, in particularly how it affects the, the body, how the body is affected by the short breathing. We should study it very comprehensively until we know what the source of the short breathing is and also what the source or cause of the long breathing is. We must study very carefully in this kind of detail. We study to the point that we know how they're different. When the breathing is long and when the breathing is short, how, is, how do their influences on the body differ? So we can become very familiar with it until we know all aspects of the breathing through studying the long and short breathing. The longness and shortness of the breathing will show us what kind of mood we're in. The state of the mind will be reflected in the kind and quality of the breathing, whether the mind is peaceful or agitated, whatever kind of mood or state it is in will be reflected in the length, the longness and shortness of the breathing, or whether it is 
the breathing is subtle and refined or coarse and crude, whether it's fast or slow, whether it's comfortable or, or agitated. The breathing can show us what kind of moods and states the mind is in. The third lesson is called Sapagayang Bhati Sangweti, which means thoroughly experiencing all bodies. In this lesson, it's the English is often incorrect. The English translations are usually wrong. They often, we found many places where Sapa Gayang is translated the whole body. But the word Sapa never means whole, it means all. And so we should correct these mistranslations so that it says all bodies. This is to investigate and thoroughly experience all bodies, namely the physical body and what we call the breath body or the breath group. In this one, we investigate until seeing clearly how the, these various bodies are interrelated, how they're connected, how the flesh and blood body and the breath body are so, so intricately connected that they can't be separated. So they're, they're coarse together, they're refined together, they're calm together. They're so closely related that the, the state of the breathing will determine the state of the body. Or we can say that the state of the body will be revealed in the state of the breathing. So we study this until seeing the intimate relationship between the breathing body and the, between the breath body and the flesh and blood physical body. Even more important than that, we must see that we can control the body by controlling the breathing. Because of this interrelationship, we can use the breathing to control the body. It's not possible for us to control the state of the body directly, but we can do it indirectly through the breathing. We can use the breathing to, to make the body more subtle and refined. By making, by calming the breathing, we can calm the body. So this is called mastering the, the body by mastering the breathing. We can make the breathing calm and cool, which results in a body which is calm and cool, a body which is undisturbed. Now, so this brings us to the fourth lesson which is calming the kaya sankara. This means calming the breathing. We practice to, to make the breathing, um, you can say we control the breathing or we adjust it, we improve it, whatever you, however you want to put it, we practice so that the breathing becomes calmer, calmer, cooler, more subtle, which makes the body calmer and cooler. Here the breath is called the Gaya Sankara, the conditioner or concoctor of the body. The breath is the thing that conditions, that, that concocts the state of the body. And so by calming, by practicing correctly to calm the, this conditioner of the body, the breath, or then the body also becomes very calm. This is the heart of the fourth lesson of the first area of practice. An example that's very obvious and clear is that when we get angry, so angry that the body is shaking, we can make the breathing calm and subtle 
When we know how to practice this, we can make the breathing calm and subtle so that the body stops shaking and the anger goes away. This is something that is quite obvious to us all. We can understand for ourselves naturally. This fourth lesson is the most important of the first stage of practice. This learning to master the body through the breathing, and so we should look at it in some detail. After collecting various methods and approaches from various texts, ancient texts and manuals and sources, I would like to offer you the following way of calming the breathing. This kind of activity is called upaya, which is pretty much the same as the English word technique. Or we could say it's even higher than a, a mere technique. We could call it a trick. So certain tricks are necessary to really calm the breathing. If we are without these tricks, then we'll get um, the results, our results will be far too little. So we should give some, see how we can benefit from certain tricks. But if we're going to offer this to people in modern times, I think it's best to use the word art, an art which is most beautiful, refined, graceful. A, special art of this very high order in order to master the breathing. I think to speak in this way is, is most attractive. The first, the first step of this art is called following after or chasing after. We imagine that the breath begins at the tip of the nose or just inside the tip of the nose and that it flows down to the navel. And then we imagine that the breath is traveling back and forth from the tip of the nose down to the navel, and then from the navel back up to the tip of the nose. Imagining the breath in this way the, the mind or sati, mindfulness, follows after the breathing. We, you can say it's the mind doing it, but it's actually the, the work of sati or mindfulness. So we say that sati follows after the breathing from the tip of the nose to the navel, from the navel back to the tip of the nose. This is the first trick are of this art for calming the breathing. <coughs> Something kind of funny or interesting that some people such as Negroes have a nose which where the breath can't really make contact with the tip of the nose because the nose is kind of upturned so the breath can be felt on the upper lip. With some people, it's this way, but most of us don't have to worry about that. What's important is just to be able to experience the breath up here somewhere and then follow the breath from here down to the navel and from the navel back to whatever point we first feel the breathing. you'll be able to see for yourself that when we can successfully follow the breathing in and out, that the breath will calm down a certain degree. Although it won't be totally calm, you'll have noticed a, cert a clear degree of calming. This is the result of following the breath in and out systematically and consistently. The next 
stage of this art of calming the breathing is called guarding. In this we choose one particular point and watch over the breath at that point. We find a point in the nose where we go to the point in the nose where we first feel the breathing and where we feel the breathing most clearly. And then instead of following the breath in and out, the mind or sati, mindfulness, can just watch at that point. It's no longer necessary to follow the breath in and out. In fact, that can become distracting. The mind can just sit at this point in the nose and guard over the breathing in and breathing out. When we can do this, it will lead to another degree of calming. There will be another, the breath will be calmed down another step. Ordinary people who, who have limited ability should practice only to this, this degree of guarding at the tip of the nose. But those people who have particularly strong abilities, who are sufficiently intelligent, who have good mindfulness, they should practice further, which means to create or bring up a mental image, a nimitta, at that point, the point where one has been guarding the breath. Now this image isn't anything real. It's just an it's just an image we imagine. It's just a picture that we create ourselves here at this guarding point. Nonetheless, it is something that we can practice with. We create an image using we create this image and then can use it to further calm the breathing. Because this is something each of us creates ourselves, these images will differ from person to person. For some it's a white spot or a white sphere. For others it can be a sphere of different colors. It could be green, blue, red, whatever. For some it might be like a cloud or a puff of cotton. The thing is to have an image which we can focus on easily, a clear, distinct image. It can be like a, a diamond, a sparkling diamond, or it can be like a spider's web twinkling in the sunlight. Any kind of clear image on which the mind can focus, this is what is, is needed here. But don't go and take this thing too seriously. Don't think that it's real or you'll get very confused. If one has even higher abilities, we can move to the next stage, which is called um, controlling the image or changing the image. Once this image appears, we can further train by mastering it. This can take different forms. You can change its color. If it's white, you can make it red, green, blue, or whatever. Or we can change its size. We can shrink it down to a point or expand it to huge, huge proportions. One can move it. One can it, make it come and go, or go from side to side or raise up and down. Manipulating, changing, mastering this image in this way is a very subtle way to further calm the breathing. This is a way of making the breathing even calmer, which within itself includes mastering, by mastering the image, we also master the mind and the body. This is this is, if one can do this, then one has great ability to, to master the breathing and the mind. It's 
rather difficult, but if one can do it, that that's, that's quite good. Now, if one has particular, as really special abilities, if one is really serious about this, then one can move to the, the next stage. <coughs> In this, we choose one of the images with this original image and its variations, we choose the one that's most soothing, the one that's most appropriate for focusing the mind. And then we use that image until apana samadhi develops. If we do this, then one can, will begin to experience, to be aware of what are called the five jhana factors. There will be vitaka, vitaka, the mind noting its object. There is vijjata, the mind experiencing the object. There is piti, a, a sense of satisfaction that, of one's ability to do this. Sukha, a calm joy that arises through this piti. And then ekagata, the mind is now one-pointed on this object. If one can choose, one chooses the, the right appropriate image and then gathers the mind fully on it, then one can, one can call up these five factors and then one has them to, to look at, to experience the five factors of jhana. When this point comes that one can summon the five factors, then one has entered the first jhana. <clears throat> now this, this first jhana is still comparatively coarse. And so if one wishes, one can calm things down even further and enter the second jhana. To do this, one calms down the first two, two factors, vidaka and vijjata, um, noting the object and experiencing the object. One can calm these away so that one no longer feels them. And when there are, the mind has just these three factors, then this is called the second jhana. In this then we can, we can experience how, mu how the breathing calms even further. The breathing and therefore the body and of course the mind are calmed and become even more subtle. We should see how this occurs through the second jhana. One observes that piti, that this satisfaction is rather disturbing. It's it's kind of busy and agitating. And so then one calms it, one calms down the piti. And then there remains only sukha, joy, and ekagata, one pointedness. When the piti has been calmed away, then this is the third jhana. And then one can observe how how much more subtle and peaceful the breathing has become, as well as the body and the mind. This is the character of the third jhana. Then one can, one can look on this sukha and then avoid or make the mind be above both sukha, joy, and dukkha. Um, unpleasantness. When the mind can avoid both pleasantness and unpleasantness, then there is what we call ubeka or equanimity, the mind that is not leaning in either direction, this totally balanced or equanimous mind. And so there remain only two factors, this ubeka and the ekagata, the one-pointedness. This ekagata, one-pointedness, one 
is when the mind is gathered together on a very high level and has Nibbana as its object. Proper Egatata has Nibbana as its, it's pointing at Nibbana, it has Nibbana as its, its object. And so at this point, in this fourth jhana, one should see how, how very subtle it is, how very calm it is for body and mind. Now, not everybody can do this. Not, it's not possible for everyone to, to reach or enter fourth jhana. However, it's not absolute, it's not necessary for everyone to do it. All that is, what's necessary is to be able to calm and quiet the breathing, as in the, the early stages of following the breathing and guarding the breathing at the, near the tip of the nose. To, so if one can do that much, if one at least has the ability of guarding the breath, to sufficiently calm the breathing, the body and mind, then one can proceed to the fourth area of practice, which is contemplation of impermanence and the other aspects of insight into Dhamma. So what's necessary for the ordinary practitioner is just this level of upajara samadhi, which can be achieved through following the breath and guarding it. But those who have greater abilities in practice should, if they can, should proceed further to calm and quiet the breathing as much as possible through the first jhana, second, third, even to the fourth jhana, if that is, if that is possible. Not everybody can do this, and we shouldn't think that we have to do it or make too much importance out of it. But if one can do it, it can be very valuable to, to make the breathing, to calm the breathing to the very refined degree of fourth jhana. By this point, the breath is so refined and calm that it even becomes a bit unclear, and there's arisen some confusion because some people say that in the fourth jhana, the breathing stops. This is a point we'd like to examine next. Now we're going to observe and compare in order to see the difference between the, the kind of breathing which is strongest, which is most powerful and and strong or vigorous, and then the most ordinary kind of breathing, and finally the breathing which is the lightest, the most subtle. So first we'll talk about the strongest, most vigorous kind of breathing. We're, we're talking about taking it to its extreme. If you want, you can give it a try now. Breathe in strongly, deeply, as far as you can, take in as, breathe in, breathe in, taking in as much air as possible. Do this strongly. If you do this to the fullest, full ex extent, you'll find that the abdomen will contract and your, the expansion will be greatest in the chest, especially the upper chest. And then if you breathe out strongly, you'll find that the chest will relax or contract and then the abdomen will, will descend, will expand. If we breathe as deep as possible, if we take in as much air as possible, if we do this with strength and vigor, we'll find that it's, it, it's not the way we usually think of the breathing. Most of the time we think that when we breathe in, the abdomen will expand and when we breathe out it will contract. But when we take this very, very deep, strong breathing, it, it turns out, it ends up differently. The abdomen will contract, it will kind of pull up 
and the chest will, ex the greatest expansion will be at the chest. You can, you can try that even now and see how it works. Now we can just breathe ordinarily. And when we breathe in, the abdomen expands or raises, rises. And when we breathe out, the abdomen contracts or falls. This is the ordinary breathing, and the abdomen moves as we ordinarily think it would, would move when we breathe ordinarily like this. And now, breathe as light as possible. Make your breath so light and so subtle that there's no sign of, of any rising or falling. Neither the abdomen nor the chest rises and falls. There's no sign of, of this movement when the breath is as light and subtle as possible. This is when we take incredibly light breath, it may seem that we're not breathing at all. So practice this, train in this way until you're able to breathe in the most light and subtle way so that there's no sign or even hint of the rising and falling of the abdomen and chest. Breathe so light that you can't feel the abdomen and chest moving at all. This, all, this explanation shows that we object to the, the explanation in the commentaries that say that in the fourth jhana we stop breathing. This is, we've tried to show that there's a kind of breathing that is so light and subtle that we don't feel it. Although we're not aware of it though, there is still breathing. And so we really don't agree with what's written in the commentary, in this particular passage in the commentary. You don't have to go and ask a doctor. Any, ki any child can tell you that if you stop breathing, you'll die. So all of this has been how we practice with the body in Anapanasati, how we use the breathing to explore the body. In particular, calming the breathing as far as we can, making it as calm and quiet as we can. If one is able to, to bring about the jhanas, if, this, if one can do this, then it's very good. But if one isn't able, don't don't be sad about that. Don't get disappointed or frustrated. It would be very foolish for those of us who don't have the ability to get upset, upset about that. So calm the breathing as much as one can so that there's enough samadhi to then go to, to proceed to the contemplation of impermanence. If one can see impermanence, and one is able to practice vipassana in order to destroy the defilements. If one can bring about the jhanas, that's very good, and one should develop that as far as possible. But one should not be, if, if one doesn't have that ability, don't worry about it. Please don't make a big deal out of it. Now, there are some minor problems that can interfere. For example, sometimes it's necessary to change our posture or position. It's not, in, it's not possible to sit forever. Now, we shouldn't make this into a difficulty for ourselves. If it's necessary to change our posture from sitting, then we change it to either the standing, the walking or the lying on our side posture. This is something that's just ordinary and we shouldn't make any difficulty of it. But what we, what we need to do is to maintain samadhi when we change our position or our posture. Don't, don't allow the samadhi, don't get upset that you have to move or are distracted by the movement so that the samadhi is lost. 
but retain samadhi as we move into another posture. It's not possible to make, if, if in sitting one has very deep samadhi, it won't be possible to maintain it at that level. It's not possible to maintain full samadhi in other postures, but retain as much samadhi as possible. And then we can say that there is samadhi in walking, samadhi in standing, samadhi in lying on one side. The Buddha said that when we have this samadhi, then our walking is divine walking. When we are standing with samadhi, then sta- that is divine standing. And when lying down with samadhi, that is divine lying. So don't, don't make this into a problem or get upset when one has to change one's posture. Do it properly and maintain as much samadhi as one can. So now we are successful in our practice with, in the first area or stage of anapanasati, which is called gayanu patsana, contemplation of the body. And so now we can go on to the second stage or area of practice, which is called vetanu Vaitanu Bhattana, the contemplation of the Vaitana, of the feelings. Now the, the Vaitana are not toys. The Vaitana are most important things, very, the highest things which, which control beings or animals. This means us. The Vaitana control us in all kinds of ways. Whatever Whatever feeling wants, whether it's good or evil, high or low, whatever the Vedana wants, it can force us to pursue it. So all kinds of our thinking and actions are controlled by the Vedana. So the Vedana are something very important because they control us on just about all levels. They control almost all of our lives. It's very necessary. So it's necessary for us to to contemplate them, to understand them in order to get free. So we're no longer the slaves of the Vedana. The essence of this stage of practice can be expressed in the following words, which you ought to remember. We will study and train with the Vedana until we can control them. The first lesson in this area of practice is experiencing bhiti or satisfaction. Whenever we are successful in something we aim at or when we get the kind of feeling we want, then bhiti, this satisfaction, there's a sense of satisfaction. This feeling of satisfaction can be very coarse or it can, it can be very subtle. Some, the crude kind of PT we might call rapture, a very excited kind of state. But PT can also be very subtle, what we might call contentment. We should study all aspects of PT both the very the coarse and the refined. This is studying the various forms of PT is the first lesson about concerning the Vedana. We will study them and train with this PT until we have the power to summon them whenever we want. Whenever we want PT to arise, we can summon it. When we have this kind of power over PT, then we have been successful in lesson, lesson five. The way of going about this is to take the PT that naturally arises when we are successful in our, the first stage of practice 
when we are able to successfully calm the breathing, there will arise satisfaction in, in that success. And then we can take that piti to, and let the mind bathe in it. The mind can drink that piti, can savor it, can bask in it. And in this way, piti is thoroughly, thoroughly experienced. If we're unable to practice correctly on that level, then we can maybe find other forms of PT. But we need some kind of PT to experience within the mind so that we know it and can, through understanding it, get power over it. The second lesson concerning the Vedana or the sixth overall of Anapanasati is to see that this PT is agitating, to see the excitement and agitation of PT, and then to calm it down. When we make PT calm and quiet, it becomes what we call sukha. That when the calmness and excited agitation, when the, excuse me, the excitement and agitation of piti is calmed and quiet. What remains is called sukha or joy. Or you can say that the piti is changed into sukha. And then one experiences that sukha, one drinks it, one bathes in it, one savors it, tastes it, until thoroughly knowing what sukha is, knowing what its nature is like, and knowing it so much that we have the ability to summon it whenever one wants. One is successful in this lesson when one can summon up sukha whenever one needs it. Then in the third lesson regarding the feelings, which requires more wisdom, this wisdom starts to have a, take a bigger role here is when one sees that both piti and sukha condition the mind, when there starts to develop the understanding that this satisfact, whether it's satisfaction or joy, it concocts the mind. This is there, so it's seeing that they are jitta, sankhara, things which condition the mind, or we can say concoctors of the mind. When we see this, we see that both piti and sukha, can, they stir up, they bring up different kinds of thoughts. So we see how they condition, how they concoct the mind. Seeing this, understanding it more and more deeply, is what the seventh, this, this third lesson, or the seventh overall, is about. When there is vetana, then there will be sanya. Sanya is to recognize whatever, when there's vetana, feeling of something, then sanya comes in and recognizes it or regards it to be this or that. Sanya here should not be confused with memory. Sanya depends on memory, but the meaning of sanya is not to remember something, but to regard it as this or that according to what we remember. And from this then there arises thoughts. In a way, sanya is to, con is to conceive of something, to regard it as this or that. And from this initial conception arises all kinds of, of thinking. So this is how from feeling there are, is sanya, and then vitaka, or thinking, which is how the feelings, how piti and sukha especially, condition the mind. Then next one sees that by calming the feelings, one decreases the power of the concocting of the mind. The feelings concoct the mind, and so due to piti and sukha, there is the power which concocts the mind, which conditions the mind. In this 
in the fourth lesson regarding the feelings, one sees this and then learns to to calm away the feelings in order to decrease decrease the power of concocting over the mind. And so one steadily decreases the power of the feelings and then the concocting of the mind decreases and decreases. This decreasing the power of the of mental concocting of jita sankara is called calming the jita sankara or making the jita sankara calm calming the mind conditioners this is what the fourth lesson of the feelings or the eighth lesson overall is about when we can calm and control the feelings like this then we can control sanya when there is this mastery of the feelings then sanya is mastered this means that we can also control our response to the the senses to the eyes ears nose tongue body and mind which means we can control we can master the flow of dependent origina- origination so by mastering the feelings by calming the feelings sanya is mastered the f- how we respond to this <clears throat> our sense activity is mastered the flow of dependent origination is mastered we can stop thinking if we wish or we can we can think but only in correct proper way this is the importance of calming the feelings in order to master them when we can master these feelings it means we can control the entire universe what this means that with one breath we can shut down or close down the universe just with one breath when we've investigated the feelings until we are able to master them when we can calm down the power of the feelings to concoct the mind when this power is thoroughly calmed then one has total control over the universe this is the mind that is that is free when the mind has mastered the universe the mas- the universe and nothing in the universe can do anything to this mind this is the mind that is very free so by practicing these four lessons regarding the feelings one can get free of the entire universe after practicing with the vetana then one comes to the jita this stage of practice is called jita nu vatsana contemplation of the mind here we study investigate and train train with the mind until we're able to master the mind when one has mastery over gaining mastery over the mind is what jita nu vatsana is about this is the third area or stage of mindfulness with breathing the first lesson is to know every kind of mind the mind that has lust in the mind free of lust the mind that is angry in the mind that is free of anger the mind that is deluded in the mind that is free of deluded we know all of these different kinds of minds as they appear the agitated mind or the the calm mind the mind which is superior or the mind which is common we know these different kinds of mind the mind which is the highest possible mind or the mind which is not yet the highest possible the mind which is concentrated and the mind which is not concentrated the liberated the mind the liberated mind or the not yet liberated mind 
even when our mind is not yet liberated, we can still <coughs> investigate what the liberated mind is like. From the mind that still has dukkha, from the mind which is still attached, we can, we can estimate or we can reckon how the mind is which is free of dukkha and free of attachment. So although the mind isn't liberated yet, we can still investigate how the liberated mind is. In the next lesson, one can summon a joyfulness, a delightedness to the mind. One can make the mind joyful and delighted at, at one's will. One can do this because of one's tata, because of confidence that the mind is going to be liberated. With this confidence in liberation, the mind will be very delighted. Or one can use the delight that arises from being able to calm the body and calm the mind as we have practiced in earlier lessons. So in this lesson, one learns to make, to make the mind joyful at will. The third lesson regarding the mind is to make the mind concentrated or make the mind samadhi. Here samadhi has three basic factors. First of all, the mind is pure, parisutto. The mind here is cleansed of the nivarana. There are no hindrances or defilements polluting the mind. The second factor is that the mind is is firmly fixed. It's well established in its object. Especially it is firmly fixed in a one-pointed way on Nibbana, which is the most, the highest object of the mind. And then last it has, this is called Samahito. And the third factor is called Gamaniyo. The mind, this mind is always ready, it's, it's fit to do anything, it's prepared for whatever work must be done, especially the work of insight in order to cut through the attachments and free the mind of attachment. So the third lesson here is to concentrate the mind so that these three factors are, are most clear. Please give special attention to the third factor, gamaniya, which is activeness. It's this tremendous activeness of mind. It's the mind that's very sensitive and flexible. This isn't the mind which is hard and stiff, but this is generally misunderstood. There's a common misunderstanding that in concentration the mind becomes kind of thick and, and hard. But when the Buddha talked about samati, samadhi, he mentioned, he emphasized this gamaniya, this activeness, readiness, flexibility, sensitivity of mind. This should be understood if we're going to practice properly. The, the fourth lesson is called vimochanang, It's liberating the mind. It's making the mind be liberated to make the mind let go and be free. Just like the communists use the word liberating, the liberated areas, it's liberating the mind in, in that way. This can mean freeing the mind from the nivarana, from the hindrances, or it can mean freeing the hindrances from the mind. You can look at it either way, and so sometimes the meaning becomes a little ambiguous for people. And so some people have translated it as something like getting rid of the mind or letting go of the mind. But it means liberating the mind from the hindrances or releasing the hindrances from the mind. So the first lesson is knowing all kinds of mind, knowing all the different types of mind. Second is being able to delight the mind, to make the mind joyful at will. 
Third is to be able to concentrate the mind however one wishes. And fourth is liberating the mind from all the things that, that bind it or cover it up. Through perfecting these four lessons, then one, one develops this third stage of practice. This is to develop one's mind to the, the highest level. Um, there isn't any time left, so we won't be able to discuss the fourth stage of practice. We'll leave it for another day. Thank you, all of you, for being very good listeners. I hope that you can take the things we've discussed today and practice them for your own benefit, for greater success in, in Dhamma. Thank you.